A Christmas Carol, A Ghost Story of Christmas by Charles Dickens. Chapter One, Marley's Ghost. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for, I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, and his sole mourner. Yes, Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story we are about to relate. But on to Scrooge. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone was Ebenezer Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out. Generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. Once upon a time, of all the good days of the year, on Christmas Eve, Old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy with all, and he could hear the people in the court outside go whizzing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal, but he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room. And so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore, the clerk put on his comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of a strong imagination, he failed. And Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah! I'm not... Don't be cross, Uncle, said the nephew. What else can I be when I live in a world of fools such as this? Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? A time for balancing your books and having every item in them presented dead against you? If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. <laughs> Uncle, please, 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 your nephew. keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed, he did. <coughs> he went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first, and with that, the bewildered but undaunted nephew politely took his leave with a final, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Uh, at, at length, <laughs> the, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. The clerk, whose name was Cratchit, observed that it was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you 
must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. Cratchit promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. Mm -hmm. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house playing at hide and seek with other houses and have forgotten the way out again. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had, been, had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Let it be borne in mind also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. Then explain to me, if you can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the, nar the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker. To say that he was not startled would be untrue, but he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Quite satisfied, he closed the door and locked himself in, double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire. As he threw his back his head in the chair, he heard a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as having, as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder floors below. Then coming up the stairs, coming straight towards his door. It's Hanna, still. I won't believe. His color changed, though, when without a pause it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leapt up as though it cried. I know him. Marley's ghost, and fell again. The same face, the very same, Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail, and his coat skirts and his hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about this middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail. And it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Though he looked the phantom through and through, and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes, and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief about its head and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before. He was still incredulous and fought against his senses, 
Who are you? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy! Why do spirits walk the earth? And why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit go not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world a woe is me, and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth, and turn to happiness. <clears throat> Again the specter raised a cry, and shook its chains, and wrung its shadowy hands. You are fettered. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link, and yard by yard. I girded it of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge glanced about him <coughs> on the floor, in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable, but he could see nothing. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate a chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. Oh, you were always a good friend to me. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. I think I'd rather not. <laughs> Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Yeah, you do. Couldn't I take them all at once and have done with it? Expect the second on the next night, and the same hour the third upon the next night, when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. The apparition walked backward from him, and every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open. Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning Scrooge to come no nearer. Then, after a moment, it floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, window desperate in curiosity. He looked out, but the spirit had faded altogether. He closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable, and being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed, without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant. <coughs> Chapter Two, The First of the Three Spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavoring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes when the chimes of a neighboring church struck the four quarters. And so he listened for the hour. The heavy bell sounded with a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy tone. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant. The curtains of his bed were drawn, and Scrooge, starting up in a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white, as if with age. And yet, the face had not a wrinkle in it, 
and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light, which was doubtless the occasion of its using, in its duller moments, a great candle snuffer for a cap, which it now held under its arm. Are you the spirit, sir? Whose coming was foretold to me? Asked Scrooge. I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. It put out its strong hand as it spoke and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall of the bedroom and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Good heaven, said Scrooge, clasping his hands together as he looked about him. I was bred in this place. I, I was a boy here. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge, its church, and winding river. The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. They left the high road by a well-remembered lane and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick with a little weathercock surmounted cupola on the roof and a bell hanging in it. Entering the dreary hall and glancing through the open doors of many rooms, they found them poorly furnished, cold and vast. In the midst of one, a lonely boy was walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge sat down and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be. The spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to the door. It opened, and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in and putting her arms about his neck and often kissing him, addressed him as her, Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home, dear brother. This was? To bring you home, home, home. Home, little fat. Yes, home for good, and all home forever and ever. Father's so much kinder than he used to be. The home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're to be a man, and you are never to come back here. But first, we're to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. You are quite a woman, little man. She clapped her hands and laughed and tried to touch his head, but being too little, laughed again and stood upon tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him in her childish eagerness toward the door, and he, nothing loath to go, accompanied her. Always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered, said the ghost. But she had a large heart. So she had. I'll not gainsay it, spirit, God forbid. Getting into the waiting chaise, the children drove gaily down the garden sweep, the quick wheels dashing the hoarfrost and snow from off the dark leaves of the evergreens, like spray. She died a woman, and had, as I think, children. One child. True. Your nephew. Scrooge seemed uneasy in his mind and answered briefly, yes. Scrooge and the ghost left the school behind them and now stood side by side in the open air. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick. This was not addressed to Scrooge or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect. For again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. He was not alone. 
but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a mourning dress, in whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little to you, very little. Another idol has displaced me. And if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? He rejoined. A golden one. I have seen, I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. And so I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but with her head turned from him, she resumed. You may. The memory of what is past half makes me hope you will have pain in this. A very, very brief time. And you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you were both. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him and they parted. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? Scrooge turned upon the ghost and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which some strange, in some strange way there were fragments of all the faces it had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me! Take me back! Haunt me no longer! In the struggle, if that it can be called, a struggle in which the ghost with no visible resistance on its own part was undisturbed by any effort of its adversary, Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright. And dimly connecting that with its influence over him, he seized the snuffer cap and by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. But though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood on the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further, of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Chapter three, the second of the three spirits. <laughs> Awakening in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed, Scrooge found himself the very core and center of a blaze of ruddy light which streamed upon him from the adjoining room as the clock proclaimed the hour of one. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter, he obeyed. There sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light upon Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, exclaimed the spirit. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple dark green robe or mantle, bordered with white fur. On its head it wore no other covering than a holly wreath set there, here and there, with shiny icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, 
Let me profit by it. Such my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. The room, the ruddy glow, the hour of the night all vanished instantly, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning. They went on, invisible, into the suburbs of the town, straight to Scrooge's clerks. On the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinklings of his torch. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed but dressed out but poorly in a twice turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar into his mouth. And two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it even for their own. What has ever brought your precious father back? said Mrs. Cratchit. And your brother Tiny Tim and Martha whacked this late last Christmas day by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two youngest Cratchits. Hurrah, there's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious zeal. Down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm Lord bless you. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits who were everywhere at once. Hi, Martha, hi. So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him. And his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limb supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Cratchit, not coming. Sorry, it's oh. Not coming. Said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits. Not coming upon Christmas Day. Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only in joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit when she had rallied Bob on his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church, because he was a cripple. And it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk in the blind men's seat. Then Tiny Tim's active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back he came before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire. And Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round, and put it on the hob to simmer. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one. And Bob served out the hot stuff from the jug with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then he proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Which all the family echoed. God bless us, every one, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost. 
in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these bleachers, these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, oh, no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. All this time, the chestnuts in the jug went round and round. And by and by, they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. And Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of the pawnbrokers. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sparkling of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. Then he and the spirit were again upon their travels, much as much they saw. And far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful. On foreign lands, and they were close at home. By struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope. By poverty, and it was rich. In almshouse, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out. He left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts of this because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into the space of time they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it until they left the children's Twelfth Night Party, when looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that its hair was gray. A spirit's life so short. My life upon these slow is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Here, the time is Christmas near. It's drawing near. The chime struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Chapter four, The Last of the Spirits. Its mysterious presence filled Scrooge with a solemn dread, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant in its folds, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. You are about to show me the shadows of things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? It gave him no reply but pointed straight before them with its hand. Lead on, lead on, the night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. The phantom moved away as it had come towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along. The city seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. And there they were, in the heart of it, amongst the merchants, who hurried up and down and shaked the money in their pockets and conversed in groups and looked at their watches and so forth, as Scrooge had seen them often. 
The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. <laughs> when did he die? Last inquired night. another. Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? Asked the second, taking a vast quantity of snuff out of a very large snuff box. I thought he'd never die. God knows said the first with a yawn. What has he done with his money? Asked a red-faced gentleman. <laughs> I haven't heard, said the man with a large chin, yawning again. Left it to his company, perhaps? He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. This pleasantry was relieved with a general laugh. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral, said the second speaker. For upon my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided. Observe the pie-faced gentleman. But I must be fed if I go. Another laugh. Well, I am the most disinterested among you, after all, said the first speaker, for I never wear black gloves and I never eat lunch. <laughs> but I'll offer to go if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend for we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Bye-bye. Speakers and listeners strolled away and mixed with other groups. Scrooge knew the men and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. He fancied from the turn of the hand and its situation in reference to himself that the unseen eyes were looking at him keenly. It made her shudder and feel very cold. Let me see some tenderness connected with a death. Show me that spirit, I beseech you. The ghost conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet. And as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner and sat looking at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The color hurts my eyes. The color? Ah, poor tiny Tim. They're better now again said Cratchit's wife. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I won't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home. For the world, it must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he's walked a little slower than he used to, these few last evenings, mother. They were very, very quiet again. And at last she said, and in a steady, cheerful voice that only faltered once. I have never been walking. I have never been walking time to part the shoulder. Very fast indeed. And so have I, cried Peter, often. And so have I, exclaimed another, and so at all. But he was very light to carry. She resumed, intent upon her work. And his father loved him, to, uh, loved him so. That it was no trouble, no trouble. And there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him. And little Bob and his comforter, oh, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob. And they all tried who should help him to it most. And then the two young Cratchits got upon his knee and laid each child a little cheek against his face. As if they said, don't mind it, Father. Don't be grieved. 
Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went to take them, Robert? said his wife. Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green the place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised that I would walk there on Sunday. And I know, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was very, very little child, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves, yes, and forget poor Tiny Tim in doing it. No, no never, Father. They all cry. I am very happy, said little Bob. I am very happy. Mrs. Cratchit kissed him, his daughters kissed him, and the two young Cratchits kissed him, and Peter and himself shook hands. Spirit of Tiny Tim, thy childish essence was from God. Spectre, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him, as before, into the resorts of businessmen, past the court where Scrooge's counting house stood. Scrooge wondering all the while whither they were going, until they reached an iron gate. Scrooge paused to look around before entering. A churchyard. Scrooge's mind raced. Here, perhaps, the wretched man, the news of whose death Scrooge overheard, lay underneath the ground. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Scrooge advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape. Before. I draw near to that stone to which you point. Answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Still, the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. And men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. No, spirit, no, no. Hear me, I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been, but for this intercourse. So why show me this if I am past all hope? For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered light. The kind hand trembled. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach or tell me, that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free himself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. What's today? cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes. Hey! Returned the boy with all his might of wonder. Well, what's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why? Christmas Day. Ah, uh, it's Christmas Day, said Scrooge to himself. I haven't missed it. 
The spirits have done it all in one night. Uh, hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the uh, corner? I should hope I do. Oh, an intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. <laughs> do you know whether they sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? What, the one as big as me? Yes. <laughs> what a delightful boy. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. And tell them to bring it here that I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll, I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. Whispered Scrooge, rubbing his hands and splitting with a laugh. <laughs> I think he shall know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Scrooge rushed headlong downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's men. As he stood there, waiting his arrival, the knocker caught his eye. <laughs> I shall love it as long as I live, cried Scrooge, patting it with his hand. <laughs> Scarcely ever looked at it before. What, what an honest expression it has on its face. A wonderful knocker. Ooh, here's the turkey. Hello. Woo -hoo -hoo. How are you? Scrooge, Merry Christmas. chuckling uncontrollably all the while, dispensed the enormous bird to the unsuspecting Cratchits, recompensed the resourceful boy, then dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present. And walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded everyone with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant, in a word, <laughs> that three or four good-humored fellows said, Good morning, sir. Merry Christmas to you. He turned his steps toward his nephew's house, past the door, a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash, and he did it. Is your master at home, my dear? Said Scrooge to the girl. Nice girl, there. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, along with his mistress. I'll show you up the stairs, if you please. Uh, thank you. Uh, he knows me. Said Scrooge with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear. He turned it gently and sidled his face in round the door. They were looking at the table, which was spread out in a grand array, for these young housekeepers are always nervous on such points and like to see that everything is right. Fred? Why, bless my soul. Cried Fred. Who's that? It's out. <laughs> Your Uncle Screw. I have come to dinner. <laughs> Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in. It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be hardier. His niece looked twice the same. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office the next morning. Oh, he was there early. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. Quarter past. No Bob. He was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. Cratchit's hat was off before he opened the door, and he was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. <laughs> Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here? at this time of day. I, I, I'm very sorry, sir. I, I am behind my time. 
You are? <clears throat> yes. I think you are. Step this way. <laughs> it's only once a year, sir. Pleaded Bob, appearing from the tank. It, it shall never be repeated. I, I, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. <clears throat> now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand for this kind of thing any longer. And therefore, and therefore, I am about to raise your salary. <laughs> Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down with it, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help and a straitjack. <laughs> A Merry Christmas, Bob. A Merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family. And we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. <laughs> Make up the fire and buy another coal scuttle before you do another dot another I. Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend as good a master and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. He had no further discourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone.